All right, again, welcome to our September Master Gardener Garden Talk, a fall palette for migrating monarchs. I am Jan Beglinger. I'm the Master Gardener Coordinator here in Genesee County, and I will turn it over to our Master Gardener, Pam Moore, who has been immersing herself in monarchs this year. Thanks, Jan. And Jan is correct. I am immersing myself in monarchs. And um, disclaimer, that is not the reason I became a master gardener. I have a Victorian home and my goal becoming a master gardener was to establish beautiful, formal Victorian gardens around my house. But Jan has exerted her influence on me and I now have morphed into someone who's going back to my uh, professional roots as an environmentalist, conservationist. Um, I worked for several years at EPA as an attorney. And so now uh, I am on a mission to help save the monarch. So um, this program has been a great deal of fun putting together. Jan and I have been working on it since January. Many of the photos you will see today are photos that Jan has taken that she graciously shared with me. Uh, a lot of the photographs are mine. And uh, we both have uh, written articles about this that have been in the Batavia newspaper. We're developing coordinating brochures. And this is actually part two of a series. Part one was in February and we talked about the plight of monarchs, the flight of monarchs and what you could do to help both as an advocate and a gardener. And today we're going to focus on a fall palette of flowers for migrating monarchs. So I'd like to start by setting the stage and I already gave it away. Monarchs are in danger of extinction. The caterpillars feed only on milkweed and milkweed is disappearing at a very rapid rate throughout the US. In fact, the habitat is disappearing along the entire 3000 mile migratory route for the Eastern monarchs. And that's a combination of the milkweed going away, urbanization, pesticides and weather. So in order to make sure that the monarch does not become extinct, we need to all come together and all means local gardeners, it means not for profits, it means the government, it means landowners to help restore the habitat that we need for monarchs. And in particular, today we're going to talk about a problem and that is that the Western uh, New York area is an area where migratory, the migratory, the, excuse me, the migration begins. So in the fall, the monarchs need to bulk up both their weight and energy. And for that, they need nectar. And the nectar that they need comes from the flowers in our gardens. But as gardeners, if you're participating today as a gardener, you know that right about now, your flower beds begin to wane. So the purpose of today's program is to provide you with some information and hopefully some inspiration to plant flowers that will continue through the fall that will be available for the monarchs as they prepare for them, their migration to the mountains near Mexico City. Now I started out pretty grim, but there is a glimmer of hope. There are things going on. And we hope today that after you see this program, you will join the effort. If you look at the slide, you'll see the count of monarchs that started in 1997 with the Ziri Society counting monarchs. And uh, the green bar show the number of monarchs counted and the blue line shows the number of places that are counting monarchs. But you'll see the green bar goes down at a very rapid rate. This is why we believe that they're on their way to extinction. The good news is in 2021, the Thanksgiving count was up. Unfortunately, one year does not make a trend. So that is not any cause for people to have a sigh of relief and say, we're making more progress and we don't need to worry so much. To the contrary, if you look at the blue line, many more people and many more places are tracking the monarchs. And still, if you go from 1997 to 2021, the number of monarchs has declined at an alarming rate. In July of 2022, the International Union for Conservation of Nature designated monarchs as in danger. And that thankfully created a lot of publicity. The publicity has really been building since about 2014 when the Ziri Society 
petitioned the US Food, excuse me, the US Fish and Wildlife Service to put monarchs on the endangered species list. In 2014, then that kicked off an analysis by the government with lots of research. And they finally made the determination that all the data was correct. However, there are other species that are in greater danger of becoming extinct. So they pushed off the decision on declaring monarchs extinct and on the endangered species list until 2024. Unfortunately, looking at the slide and the chart of where we've dropped off, we really can't wait until 2024 to find out if the federal government is going to place them on an endangered species list. And indeed, even the US federal government has reached the same conclusion. They are doing more research. The government in Canada is doing more research because the northernmost southern breeding ground is the southern part of Canada, and it continues all the way down to Mexico. And the Mexican government is also engaged in actions to try to protect the monarch. This has spawned a lot of interest. There are many not-for-profits, the Ziris Society, the Save the Monarch Foundation and other foundations. Monarch Watch uh, has a program called Monarch Way Stations and they're all joining efforts to try to get more attention and more restoration for the monarchs. And there is more research underway in all three countries. Some of it is government sponsored and some of it is independent university research, but the research is emerging and the research is providing more information that will inform the government as to what restoration efforts can be taken. And if it is put on the endangered species list by US Fish and Wildlife, then the government will be able to take actions that will help restoration projects. So citizens are also getting involved. They're doing everything from participating in things like the Thanksgiving count to tagging monarchs every year so we can trace where they exactly are going and also local programming, uh, presentations before zoning boards and just adding milkweed to your garden, adding nectar rich plants to your garden. And finally, another piece of good news is that more and more garden centers and nurseries are carrying native plants. Native plants provide the best nectar for the monarchs and even milkweed is showing up in the nursery. So if the nurseries you shop at don't have the native plants yet, don't have the milkweed, the nectar rich plants, ask for it. The more people that ask, the more likely they're gonna to begin to carry it. So a little bit more about the science before we move into the flowers. And the life cycle of the monarch is very important. The female butterfly lays her eggs on milkweed. Then the eggs hatch and the caterpillars that emerge will begin to eat the milkweed leaves. That is the only thing they eat. That is their only source of food. And a caterpillar can eat one leaf in five minutes. A caterpillar can devour an entire milkweed plant in one day. So we need a lot of milkweed. The caterpillars oftentimes don't make it all the way to the chrysalis state. And the mother monarch butterflies lay hundreds of eggs. And yet we are not seeing hundreds of monarchs in our gardens. If those of us that plant milkweed, um, for example, this year I have seen no caterpillars at all. So a lot of the caterpillars don't even make it to the chrysalis state where they remain for a time before they emerge as an adult butterfly and the cycle begins again. So as I said, the eggs are laid on the milkweed and the caterpillars eat only milkweed. So in the left-hand slide, you'll see an adult female and she is on a butterfly weed milkweed plant. She appears to be just looking around. Uh, she's obviously not taking advantage of any nectar because it's still in the bud form. So she may be looking around to see if this is an appropriate place to lay her eggs. And on the right is an example of the monarch caterpillar and it has very distinctive coloration. And so if you decide to plant milkweed, this is what you're going to look for. So basically the title says it all here, no milkweed, no monarchs. So my mantra is that the milkweed deserves more respect, more understanding and more love and please plant milkweed. 
Now there are 72 different species of milkweed. Of the 72, five are milkweeds that grow in Western New York and beginning at the left and moving to the right is the milkweed in order of abundance in Western New York State and also preference by the monarchs. So we begin on the left with the common milkweed, which you often see along the sides of the roads, which we used to see along farm fields all the time, but farmers are using um, products that will tamp down the growth. And so that's one reason that we are losing the milkweed and the habitat um, is important. Without the habitat, we have no monarchs, but the other problem is that a lot of these fields are being turned into housing developments. And added to the mix is the fact that a lot of municipalities are cutting the milkweed along the sides of the roads. When I grew up in Western New York uh, decades ago, we just left it all natural. And now we want nice clean mowed edges. Moving to the right is the swamp milkweed, has a similar look to the common milkweed, but just prefers a more moist environment. In the center is the butterfly weed milkweed. And this is the one that I feature in my garden, which is in a village. Um, the people that walk by on the sidewalk see it. They often ask what it is. They think it's quite unusual. It has the little tiny yellow and orange blossoms. The native species is orange. This is a cultivar, which has the yellow and the orange. But people will ask me what it is. And until it actually begins turning uh, the the blossoms into the pods in the fall, people can't believe it's milkweed. So if you live in a more suburban urban setting, you need a more formal garden. This is a particularly good plant to put in because you're providing the milkweed and yet it doesn't look like milkweed. Although looking like milkweed, um, if you change your mindset, isn't all that bad. Um, moving to the right is the world milkweed which has a more narrow leaf. And then finally on the far right is the poke milkweed. So here are the five choices that we have here in Western New York. And I would just like to note that I said that more research was being done and as the research was being done, it was informing uh, the government and not-for-profits and individual citizens and gardeners more about what needs to be done for restoration. Research has shown that if you interplant milkweed with other natives, the rate of eggs laid on the milkweed goes up by 22%. So you're sort of killing two birds with one stone. If you plant the milkweed in with your other flowers, the number of eggs are going to increase. And also if you plant it in among your other flowers and you look at the scale and you look at the texture and the shape of the plant, you can, if you wish to, more or less disguise the milkweed. So in my garden, the milkweed has emerged from the east property line where it was kind of hidden to being actually featured in the garden because I'm working it in with the other plants. Uh, that is something that you need to be somewhat careful of if you're in a more urban or suburban environment because there are zoning code restrictions sometimes in some communities uh, that would prevent that from happening if someone actually recognized it. So again, I'd like to make the point that the monarch butterflies that arrive here in late spring are going to need the rich nectar from the flowers from their time of arrival through mid-fall. So here we see beautiful examples. There's a butterfly in each, and these are all midsummer pictures. The one on the right is closest to fall because the zinnias continue to bloom into fall, but then it drops off. So again, what we're gonna to move to next is talking about what we need to do to plant flowers in the fall palette. So first let's begin by looking at what attracts the monarchs. And the native plants provide the most energy. So it's good to look towards the native plants to start out if you're going to be building a habitat that the monarchs are gonna be attracted to and then look to color. And they prefer the red, purple, pink, and orange color palette. They prefer a flat top because it's easier for them to light on and to actually get the nectar. They also, research has showed, prefer when there are drifts of flowers. So just don't put in, you know, 
one of this and one of that and one of something else, put in an entire drift and that's more likely to attract the monarchs. Now, that said, if you're just beginning your monarch garden, you can do uh, what I am doing and what Jan has told me, many gardeners that are doing this are doing, and that is try something. So if it's a new plant and it's a perennial and you're not sure about you know, uh, where it should go, we always tell people when they call the helpline, you, know, you need the right plant for the right place. So don't go out, spend a fortune, put in a bunch of perennials and find out that they're not happy there. Because if they're not happy, they're not gonna grow. And if they don't grow, they're not there to provide the nectar. So if you wanna try one of something as you're starting it, by all means do that. That's a nice way to kind of step into it. But then if you look at the photo here with the monarch, there are exceptions. This monarch is very happy on a hydrangea, which is not native, which is not red, purple, pink or orange, which does not have a flat top. And it's a sole plant in a mixed bed of annuals and perennials. So it doesn't mean that monarchs won't go to something that doesn't fit this criteria. It's just that they are more likely to. And if you have an established garden and you want to create a monarch way station or a butterfly garden, or just try to attract more monarchs, don't rip everything out, work with what you have as a basis because this is living proof that they will uh, go beyond what is on this list of criteria. So here we're encouraging you to add the late summer and fall blooming plants and going from left to right, we have Jerusalem artichoke and annual salvia and also the marigolds. And you can see that the Jerusalem artichoke is a flat top, the marigolds are a flat top. And um, while the salvia doesn't appear to be a flat top, that certainly looks like a very happy monarch. So this is September. It's all in one garden on Mackinac Island in Michigan. And my husband and I were visiting. And by this time, Jan was beginning to work away at me and what I ought to be thinking about doing and maybe adding more natives and maybe creating you know, a habitat that was more friendly for pollinators. And I looked at this garden and these were all taken in the space of a half an hour in the same garden. So we have the salvia, the marigold, the rose and the hydrangea. This actually was my inspiration for stepping up my efforts beyond just having the milkweed along the east property line to actually set up a monarch way station. And it took more than one year to do that. I began my efforts uh, and finally this year I did register my garden as a monarch way station. One of the first things that we need to do as gardeners and we need to do as advocates for the monarch is to rethink our vision of a weed. This photo I took in Bouchard Gardens, which is on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada, and front and center is a beautiful goldenrod. That's a weed. This is a world-renowned garden. It's one of the most traveled to gardens in all of the Western Hemisphere, and it features a weed. So this goldenrod is a prime example of why we need to rethink our vision of a weed. So for you in the room and for you people on Zoom, I want you all to squint your eyes or take your hand and cover up the goldenrod and what do you see? You see a lovely garden, but it doesn't have the drama and it doesn't have the pizzazz that the picture has with the goldenrod there. So that's why I'm saying, let's rethink our vision of a weed because that's gonna be important as we plan to do a garden that's going to draw monarchs. So let's talk a little more about the goldenrod. The goldenrod comes in many, many varieties. And um, I've got two examples here. On the left is the fireworks goldenrod. And that is something that has just a spectacular look to it. The architecture is outstanding. It's different from a lot of other things. And it just proves that if you want to have the perfect fall palette garden, a key player, an anchor player, you should consider is the goldenrod. Then if you look to the right, you'll see another goldenrod. It's the grass leafed goldenrod. And it has a totally different look to it. 
the blossom is buttery. It's not the gold gold of the fireworks. The leaf structure is different and it provides a real contrast in color and in texture that again allows you to create a garden that's pleasing not only for the monarchs because you're providing that nutrient rich nectar that they need, it's also giving a pop to your fall garden that by this point may be waning and you may be like me when I would see all of my you know, flowers that I'd spent all year weeding and watering and summer goes by so quick here and then all of a sudden my garden looks really dead. And um, I got to be a really anti-fall flower garden person where it was hard to go out and do anything. And I usually ended up planting my daffodils in the snow which is not the optimum time to plant daffodil bulbs, but I would just delay going out because I just didn't enjoy my fall garden. As I've added more to my fall palette, I'm enjoying my fall garden a lot more and I think you might find the same. So again, part of the planning process, we want continuous bloom, we wanna add beauty and drama to our gardens for ourselves and we wanna add the nectar for the monarch. So here's a perfect way to do that if you decided and you could pick, there are many, many species of goldenrod, so you could pick different ones, but here are three examples where you begin with the early, which is the Canada goldenrod, you move to the grass leaved, which is the mid blooming in the fall, and in the late fall, the fireworks sets off that spectacular display of gold that's going to make you and the monarchs happy. Another keystone for a fall garden is asters. And again, we talked about what colors they like. And on the left, we see a white flat topped aster. Well, that's fine because it's got that gold center and the gold center of that then will pair nicely with the goldenrod, which you looking carefully will see behind it and to the right. So that's a perfect way to you know, combine things and create the drama that you wanna create. White is always a very dramatic color in the garden and that's a wonderful way to do it. I happen to like white, so, and I'm not so fond of orange. So for me, picking the white flat topped aster would be a very good choice. And then on the right, you'll see where the aster is mixed again with the golden rod in the back. It's a purple yellow combination, again, very attractive. So a little more about the flat topped aster. You can see where uh, starting now, I'm going to go through the name, the height, the moisture and the sun requirements for these plants, um, which is probably gonna appeal a little more to you people who actually want to put in a butterfly or a monarch habitat garden, and maybe less so to people that just wanna look at pretty fall pictures of flowers. And I can certainly understand that. I like to see uh, pretty fall pictures as well. So if you look at this, you will see that uh, not only are there huge clusters, which can reach 10 inches across, but this is a particularly long blooming aster. So it will be in the garden for quite some time. Next, we'll move on to the New England aster. This happens to be called Grape Crush. I added it to my garden this year as part of my effort to put in that Monarch Way Station. And uh, I'm sure you're all aware from going to nurseries in the fall that the uh, purple asters, in particular the New England purple asters, are in great availability in all of our nurseries and garden centers. What you should do is buy them now, early September, get them in the ground, give those roots a chance to really take off and get in the ground and get happy before fall really hits. I can't tell you how many uh, purple New England asters I have planted that bit the dust because I didn't plant them early enough. I left them on the steps so I'd have a cheerful uh, bucket of flowers as I walked into the house. Um, I'm now moving them into the gardens and um, I think they'll be very happy there. If you object to the height, and these get to be 26 to 30 inches, you can cut them back before mid-July and that will keep them shorter and it'll also eliminate the need for staking. So again, there, there are choices. Um, next, the New England Aster Purple Dome. Now this one, I uh, went along with the advice on the tag 
and I planted it near my autumn joy sedum, which had been there for years and years. So you'll see in the larger picture in the bottom right are the first few blossoms on the purple dome aster. So you get the idea of the color. It's a very deep violet color with a yellow center. It's very striking. Behind it is the sedum. And right now, it, this picture was taken two weeks ago, and you can see that the um, actual flower head is lightening up a little bit and getting a little bit of a pink tinge to it. And then in the bottom right, you'll see what the Autumn Joy sedum looks like in about two to three weeks. And at that time, the purple dome aster will be in full bloom so you can envision what the contrast will be. So as you're doing this, there are many things that you can use for information. There are books, there's things that we have available for you, but also the um, actual tags on the plants sometimes will give you a good companion plant. And I decided to take their advice and by putting these two pictures together, I think I'm really gonna like it. Next is the sky blue aster. This is an aster that I bought mail order because I went on um, a site that Jan referred me to. They sell all natives. They have a portion on the site that tells you if you want to attract monarchs, these are the flowers that will attract monarchs. For my palette, which was the first slide, I wanted to have something blue. And so I thought, well, my palette should have as many colors as possible. This is the first and only bloom until this morning as I was getting ready to leave and come to this program that I have. So you start out small. I bought six of these and they um, are all slowly developing. I hope to have a drift of them next year. But if you look at the catalogs, if you do your research, you can see what's available and it'll give you the information that you need to build something that will be pleasing to your eye and will also add diversity to the garden and the nectar for the monarchs. New York ironweed. So I think the title says it all. It is a regal titan in a fall garden. It is so striking, it's three to six feet and it does well in all kinds of sun exposure from full to partial to dappled and it is something that if you have a lot of space, you really should consider. You do need to consider scale as you are developing this. Um, in the background, you will see behind the ironweed, fireworks, goldenrod, and that's the two to three feet. So you can get an idea of the scale because that's immediately behind it. So that gives you an idea of the scale of the ironweed. And it also gives you an idea of how the yellow and the purple go together to give you that really dramatic pop. Next, I'd like to talk about Joe Pye weed. And the first thing I wanna tell you is ignore the word weed. In fact, in general, as you're planning to build a garden that's going to feature monarchs and attract monarchs, ignore the word weed if it's associated with a particular plant you want, because um, there's so much available today, you can work around that and you could work it in even to the suburban type cottage garden that I have. So um, if you look at this, you're gonna see something that's providing a lot of nectar and something that provides a lot of color, it provides height and it's nice to vary the height in your gardens as well. So really this is something that you potentially could work into almost any garden, except maybe if you only have a balcony and um, an apartment setting. But even then, while the Joe Pie won't be appropriate, there is a way to attract monarchs to that type of gardening with containers. And we'll talk about that in part three of the series that we're gonna do next spring. So I was reading about all the different plants and I saw a quote that said that Joe Pye weed was bodacious and bountiful. And I love those two words, bodacious and bountiful. It's just so appealing because it just gives you the idea of what your garden is gonna look like without even knowing what the plant looks like. But here is the plant and it is. You see the close up here of one blossom and then you get the idea of the scale 
of what we're going to call a common Joe pie weed, which most people may think of when they think of Joe pie. And here it is. Again, you see the scale, you see the drama. Uh, in a way, the photo on the left is very similar to the photo from Bouchard Gardens where they featured the goldenrod as the centerpiece. But instead here, we see the Joe pie weed. So if you go more towards the purple mauve in terms of what you like in the way of color, you could just switch out the Joe pie for the goldenrod and achieve much of the same look. So it's really up to you. This fall palette is allowing you to become an artist, an artist in your own garden, an artist that's going to provide the rich nectar that the monarchs require for their flight and uh, is going to provide people that walk by or drive by your garden with the same opportunity to see a beautiful garden in the fall. In fact, I have a retired neighbor that lives across the street and um, the man that lived next door to him has now moved. The first year I put in my garden where I was going to feature all the pollinators and hopefully get butterflies to come, offered to come over and bushwhack all of my flowers down because it looks so terrible. And I very graciously told him that this was by intent and that we weren't going to be bushwhacking anything, but thank you for the offer. So the man that lives next door to him said last year, well, you know, we really wondered about what you were doing over there, but I sit on my front porch and read a lot. And I noticed the people that walk by stop and they're looking at all your plants. And he said, and on the weekends, people even stop their cars and look. So I guess maybe we were wrong. And so I consider that a semi-apology and recognition of the fact that, it, yes, it takes time. And in the beginning, it's not beautiful. And I don't have my way station sign in my garden yet because uh, I am kind of a perfectionist. And in my eyes, it's not quite up to snuff. And I do not want to discourage anybody from putting in this type of garden, it's not going to happen in one season. If you think it is, um, you're going to have to bring in a crew to help you. <laughs> uh, and I've tried to enlist my husband and he, you know, that's a crew too, and that's still not enough. So it's going to take a while, but you can get there and you also have the joy of seeing it come to life. And uh, now the only thing I need is more monarchs and hopefully next year there will be. Now this is the, uh, Joe Pye Weed. This is the Baby Joe. This is at a garden center in Erie County. Uh, my poor husband, wherever we go, if there is a garden center or a nursery, somehow I have managed to program the car that it turns in. So we were driving down the street and I said, oh, you've got to stop, turn in, turn in. And I found this entire table of native plants and the Joe Pye, the Baby Joe Pye was there. And you know, he's kind of standing out there and he looks a little lonely. And so somehow he ended up in my trunk. Uh, <laughs> and that's the way it often happens. It's like, oh, okay, well, Jan's saying Joe Pie. And I have the little Joe, which didn't grow very much the first year. I put it in last fall. It didn't get real big. There weren't going to be any blossoms on it for this presentation. I wanted pictures for this presentation. I took them at the nursery store. And then I thought, well, you were so kind to pose for me for these pictures. I guess I need to take you home and give you a home. So uh, little Joe is uh, beginning to come into bloom in the backyard. And baby Joe is going to find a spot near the road where everybody that walks by will see him. Okay, Rugosa Rose, why is this here? When I first had this picture in there, Jan said, well, wait a minute this isn't fall blooming. And I said, well, it was on Mackinac Island. And so we put it in, but we identified that it's Mackinac Island. Yes, uh, there are some rugosa roses that are still in bloom in this area. In fact, I saw some in Fairport along the Erie Canal last week, but they are tailing off. But it's an example of if you have this in your garden, and a lot of people do have rugosa roses in their garden, use this as a beginning to expand upon and you can kind of attach your monarch garden to it. And you've got some uh, plants that you like that monarchs are clearly attracted to and uh, some instant gratification for your garden if you use what you have. Sneezeweed. Okay, another plant with a very pejorative name. 
And um, actually the sneeze weed does not make people sneeze. The derivation of sneeze weed is that uh, many years ago, the leaves and the blossoms were ground up and made into snuff. And that's why it got the name sneeze weed. So uh, unfortunately it continues to be maligned by its name. So that's why I said earlier, if the word weed appears with uh, the name of anything you're thinking about planning, just ignore it because this one is a total misnomer. And so it should be considered because it is something that adds a lot of color. It is intolerant to uh, very dry soils, and it's also intolerant to over fertilization. It'll get very leggy, but uh, it's a perfect fall flower for your garden. And if you like it and you put it in, if you even want to try to extend the bloom season more, even though it might be a tad tedious, if you deadhead it, it will continue to bloom and uh, provide more beauty throughout the rest of the season. Sedum or stone crop. This is one of my favorite plants. Uh, my mother and I began planting this decades ago. Uh, I first got it when I was living in Pennsylvania. I shared it with her. When I moved home from Pennsylvania, she shared it back with me. And um, I've planted it in a drift along the sidewalk. So this is my home and you can see the sidewalk where I have my garden and I've planted it in a drift. Um, interspersed between it is some uh, walkers low which is another plant that the pollinators just love. Uh, the bees gravitate towards it and it starts early, early, like late May, and it's still in bloom right now. So what we find is that if you create a habitat that monarchs like, it's also gonna be a habitat that a lot of other pollinators like. So um, a lot of the other pollinators like the monarch are endangered facing extinction, declining in number because their habitats are going away. So by featuring the monarch, um, and I heard one person say as he sat down here, uh, well, I don't even particularly like butterflies. Well, that's okay. If you like bees, uh, you get the same bang for your buck by putting in a garden that features uh, things that I'm talking about for monarchs because you'll bring their friends along too. And their friends are just as beautiful and entertaining as the monarchs are. I took about 40 pictures one Saturday morning of the bees in the walkers low, sitting right next to it, close enough that I could hear the hum of the bees. And I sent the picture to my brother and he said, oh, looking for an anaphylactic reaction? What were you doing that close to the bees? And I said, they didn't bother me at all. And after all, after all these years, you ought to know, between me and a bee, they want something sweet. So they were going to the flowers, not me. Um, that's the last we heard about me getting cozy with the bees in my garden, uh, because now I, I think that I'm as fond of the bees um, in the garden as I am when I see a little uh, cricket or I see a monarch butterfly. For years, I kind of did stay away from the bees. I was afraid of being stung, but they're coming and they're certainly welcome visitors as well. And if you look at this, you will see what the sedum blossom looks like uh, in the upper left, like throughout the summer. Then this is like mid to late summer. And then the bottom right is the fall. So it evolves over time. And so it provides a change in color and a look to the garden, which is always nice as well. Okay, next is the brown eyed Susan. The special consideration here is that it's actually a biennial or a short-lived perennial in our area, but it also self-sows. And it's easy to plant it adrift as you see here. So clearly this is something uh, that you can add to your garden if you do buy one as I did last fall. Uh, and the tag did not indicate that it was a biennial. Uh, and didn't indicate itself so. So this spring I got bored when I didn't see anything coming up and I pulled out everything and something else got planted there. So this is one you need to be a little patient with, but if you are, it will reward you with many blooms as you see in this picture. Jerusalem artichoke. This is absolutely positively one of my favorite plants. I have it featured right in the front of my garden. 
It gets six to 10 feet high. This is what part of what my neighbor wanted to bushwhack for me. And I declined, but um, special consideration, it is an aggressive spreader. It spreads both by the rhizomes and it also self seeds. And it's done both in my yard. I now have it in three places in the yard. I'm totally content with it, even if the neighbors aren't. Um, of note, the tubers are actually edible. And uh, they were used as food by Native Americans. And when the French explorer Champlain came to uh, our shores in 1605 in Cape Cod, he saw it, he took it back to France. So the two areas where it's most likely to be used as food are Native Americans in the US and in France as a delicacy. And it can be grated in a salad. It has a nutty flavor, can be grated in a salad. It can be boiled as a potato. It does not contain starch. So for people that have uh, type two diabetes, they tolerate it better because it's, the inulin is converted to fructose. So it's better tolerated. I have not tried it yet. Um, I try to cook things that my husband likes and he's like, no, I don't think I'm gonna be eating this plant but I think I may sneak it in a couple things this fall just to see you harvest it approximately two weeks after it stops blooming. And it is absolutely gorgeous. And as you can see, the butterflies like it and it's flat topped, but it's yellow. It's not one of the colors that they're apparently attracted to. But again, if it's there and available and in quantity, and this is in a large drift, uh, they will come to it. Next, white snake root. Again, not a great name. But I did some research to see why it got this name, and it was used by Native Americans as a uh, product that would help treat snake bite. Now, we're not suggesting that. I'm just giving you what the history is. Um, part of the rest of the history is related to the special considerations, and it will cause at certain times of the year something called milk sickness. And if you drink milk that has um, been, if you drink milk that comes from cows that have eaten this during certain parts of the season, the milk will then become poisonous and that is what killed Abraham Lincoln's mother. So um, again, it's the white, gives you a nice pop. It is tall, um, it has an interesting history, but it is something that also like the Jerusalem artichoke, is aggressive, spreads by rhizomes and self-seeding. If you deadhead it, it will prevent the self-seeding. Uh, and you probably need a larger, uh, more rural setting for this to effectively be used. Next is Coreopsis. The one in the center is one that I put in years ago. And you can see it's the fancier version and it really doesn't have the flat top. But again, I started with what I had. I knew I liked Coreopsis. I knew Coreopsis grew well in my garden. So when I started buying the plants to supplement and to create the monarch beds, I then found the lance leaf Coreopsis. I bought that online. Um, again, this is brand new this year. So I interspersed it with other flowers to give it a chance to grow. But uh, now I have my original Coreopsis, which is the double. And I've added a lot of the lance leaf. And that's how I knew I could take the risk and buy a number of them to create a drift because I knew my garden would tolerate. Coreopsis on the far right is an annual version. So I was unaware that this was available at the time that I was making my spring purchases. And what I did is I took the lance leaf and I actually planted it in a triangle. And then I planted marigolds around it. So I would have the color that I needed to try to create a more pleasing to the eye garden this year, but the marigolds would be gone next year. Had I known that there was an annual Coreopsis, I could have put that in there and let that fill in. So there's different ways to do it, but annuals are a nice way as you're building your perennial portion of the garden to fill in with them. And um, I chose some of the marigolds because they had a similar color. So it was giving me an idea of what the color was going to look like as it developed into a full garden. Um, again, if you want to extend the bloom because these start blooming early in our area in the summer. And if you want to have the fall blossoms, you're going to have to deadhead. And again, a somewhat tedious job, but it can be done and it's very rewarding. Cosmos. 
Uh, I planted this in my garden years ago and I was delighted to see that the butterflies were going to like it as well because my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother all planted this. So for me, it has a real um, historical connection. It reminds me of my childhood gardens and their gardens when I was a child. So I have added this, you can see in the back is the daylily. So this is obviously an early summer shot. Um, again, the bees and the other friends of the monarchs love the cosmos. And it's really something that um, I was very pleased to see that the monarchs were going to be attracted to as well. Spider flower. This is another old standby. Uh, it's height two to four feet is perfect in your garden. If you wanna create a border in the back, this is a perfect border plant. In addition, it not only attracts the butterflies, it attracts hummingbirds. So for those of you who also love hummingbirds, this is something that will attract hummingbirds. It comes in a, a variety of uh, colors. In fact, there are about 150 species. In uh, New York, we grow it as an annual and you can pick it up at the garden stores or you can uh, grow it yourself or it does self seed in white, pink, pink and white or purple. So again, depending on what you're trying to do, uh, you can use that as something that's going to provide a nice filler for you. Marigolds, these are obviously uh, something that everyone is familiar with. Here we feature two of the flat tops and um, it's going to be something that you can use not only every year where you want to maybe add a drift or maybe define a more formal border like I'm trying to do in my village garden. Some of it I want to give it a more formal structure. So I'm using things like marigolds to provide that formal structure, almost like little soldiers lined up and then behind it, it goes more native, more cottagey. Um, but the color, the orange color here is going to attract the monarchs. Um, the yellow, always for me, a welcome color. And again, deadheading is going to extend the season on those. This is uh, a salvia. This is again on Mackinac Island. And um, there are many varieties available. It varies in name, height. All of them love the full sun. Uh, the moisture varies with type that you buy. Um, it also is available as a perennial, but those tend to bloom earlier. And again, because I don't particularly care for orange flowers, I've used the orange marigolds near this to sort of tone it down and create a more pleasing view for myself. So again, customize it to what you like. Don't be uh, locked into creating a rigid garden that's you know by the book that you don't find pleasing to your eye. There's plenty available and that's why we've added so many different uh, colors and so many different plants in here just to give you an idea and to inspire you and pick and choose what you like. This is only the fall portion. Uh, in the spring, when we do the uh, summer garden, we're going to have many more plants, many more colors, many more options, and you'll be able to weave those into the garden as well. So here is a Mexican sunflower. Again, something that's stately, it's tall, the four to six feet provides a great background and you can see the variety of other flowers that are planted in front of it. It has that flat top, the monarchs love, and it is pretty forgiving in terms of moisture requirements. That's another thing you need to look at is, uh, again, when people call the helpline, we tell them to plant things that have similar water requirements together. That way you're not driving yourself crazy saying, oh, I gotta hand water this with a watering can because this one wants water and that one doesn't want water. Keep in mind what the water requirements are. And if you pick something like this that goes all the way from dry to medium, it gives yourself uh, an easier task in terms of watering. Um, and again, on a year like this year, we've had so much drought, even things that uh, say they will take dry have not done as well. So we need to keep in mind, uh, you know, how much time do you have available for watering? How far is the water source from where you're going to have to carry it if you're carrying it or if you're using the hose? Okay, another standby are zinnias, and you'll see there is a butterfly on the one on the left that Jan took. 
the picture of, and then there are other zinnias, and you'll see in the bottom right, there's a little bee taking advantage of the nectar on the zinnia. Again, uh, names vary, uh, heights vary, moisture varies, they all like full sun. But they're a great one to use as standalones and also to use to fill in as you're building your perennial garden. Uh, the tall ones, if you like to cut flowers and bring them in, are perfect for that. Uh, the one on the bottom right here uh, is the more mounded version with the shorter stalks. And again, I've sort of used those to create a drift and to create a definition along uh, the sidewalk, again, to give more structure to that uh, suburban garden I have. So what can you do to help? Well, uh, you can advertise the fact that you are supporting monarchs and supporting pollinators. And the photo on the left is one that Jan took. This is her garden, and it is a pollinator habitat garden uh, registered through the Zierzy Society. And the uh, photo on the right is the Monarch Way Station garden that you can get once you certify your garden is one uh, developed to create, conserve, and protect monarch habitats. And you can see, and I'm hoping that the folks around Zoom can see it. So in case you can, I'm going to read this. It says, this site provides milkweeds, nectar sources, and shelter needed to sustain monarch butterflies as they migrate through North America, certified and registered by Monarch Watch as an official monarch way station, create, conserve, and protect monarch habitats. And actually, their process is uh, quite easy and uh, it's something that if you decide to build this kind of garden, you might wish to get. So let's go over quickly, because I see the time here, the elements of a welcoming habitat for monarchs. You want milkweed. You want to plant in drifts, as you see in this picture. You want it pesticide free for obvious reasons, because the pesticides will interfere uh, with the monarchs and their growth. You want to provide some shelter for them. They need a water source provide a butterfly puddler and a warming stone. So let's talk about shelter first. The photo on the left is a picture um, of some shrubs along my driveway. And it's a very windy day in August. And this butterfly, obviously not a monarch, it's a great yellow swallowtail, has taken refuge here because of the wind. It was being kind of uh, buffeted around by the wind. And then I saw it come in and kind of hide in the uh, well, there's lilac and then there's some scrub stuff there too. So uh, taking refuge there. Now, if you um, have the opportunity to add a shrub, you can do something like the red twig dogwood that's on the right. And that's called pucker up. That's the variety. And that is one that is native. So consider adding natives if you're going to add shrubs. Uh, this is going to get three to four feet tall. It meets my standard of does not require pruning. And it's deer resistant, as far as anything is deer resistant around here. And it's going to provide winter and spring interest as well, because the branches actually turn red, thus the name red twig. So if you're going to add or um, replace shrubs, consider the natives and their lists available. You can call the helpline. But that's a good choice. Again, as you're building your garden, don't rip everything out. Just use what you have and then add to it. Or when it comes time for replacement, replace with the natives. Here's a butterfly puddler. It provides nutrients to the males. Uh, it provides the enzymes that they need, especially during the mating season. It's something that's easy to make with children. It adds a decorative element. This particular puddler, which you'll see in the bottom, Center is one that Jan made, and um, it is surrounded with plants that the butterflies like. These are more of the summer plants. You'll see in the back the Mandara, the Leatrice, there is um, Queen Anne's Lace, there's Daylilies, there's Sedum, there's Marigolds, and the orange that you see in the center is the butterfly weed, milkweed, and that is at year three. Okay, this is my Esperanza garden, Esperanza meaning hope, and it is my hope that by putting in this garden and certifying it as a Monarch Watch way station that there will be more butterflies in my neighborhood and I will encourage my neighbors and friends to add Monarch gardens in their yards as well. Um, here's the Happy Bee Monarch in the Jerusalem Artichoke. 
And here we have the monarch garden that fits all the criteria of a perfect habitat. There's milkweed available. That's the orange butterfly weed milkweed. And I, it's not showing up real good in this picture, but it's in, it's between the two zinnias that I have, the two red zinnias right on the sidewalk. There is the shelter of the shrubs behind. It is a pesticide free garden. It provides water in one of the clay saucers. It has the uh, puddler in the other clay saucer. There is a warming stone next to the clay saucers and it features a little gardener who loves butterflies. So again, you can extend blooming into fall with what you have uh, and you can add things. So add the plants that bloom in the late fall to summer, fill in dead spots with adding annuals or adding containers, that's another option. And as your deadheading, which will extend your blooming season, finish up your deadheading by rewarding yourself with a bouquet of either flowers you picked or flowers that you mistakenly cut out as your deadheading. So where do we find our native plants? Well, this is a partial list. No endorsement is implied by inclusion and uh, more and more places are popping up all the time. Jan will have this uh, information available that she's going to provide to anyone who signed up through Zoom. You will get this slide, which gives you the list of some, but not all of where you can find native plants. So I'd like to thank you for joining us today to go through the fall palette from uh, monarch, Migrating Monarchs. The uh, photo in the vase here was from my garden, my Esperanza Monarch Watch Garden. And it was taken on Monday, August 29th. And there are 16 different flowers in here. Some of them, there's only one, but there are 16 different. It's a combination of annuals and perennials. And it proves that you can actually achieve a great diversity of color, texture, uh, height. And hopefully this has provided some inspiration for you. If you liked what you heard today, or uh, if you're just interested in more information, please join us in the spring when we're going to do designing a summer palette of flowers for monarchs. And that will feature the summer flowers and also more information on design. This one, we were just trying to pique your interest with all the pretty pictures of flowers. Here are the references. Jan will also provide this to you. Uh, and in addition, at the bottom are uh, some resources and listed as a key resource are the things that we have available here through the Master Gardener program. We've written articles, brochures, we have a helpline that you can call. And this program and other similar programs are available if you go on our website and then click the icon to go to our YouTube channel. And again, a special thanks to Jan for helping put this program together. Without her, uh, it would not have been as visually pleasing or as educational. So thanks a lot, Jan. And I guess Jan is gonna start with Zoom questions, if there are any. Yeah, we don't have any right now, but if folks wanna unmute and ask your question, we can do that. I do want to point out on the goldenrod that um, Pam was correct. The Canadian goldenrod starts first, but that's a very aggressive plant. So if you have a small garden, I don't recommend it. But there are a lot of species of goldenrods that you can use in the garden. You want to look for the clumpers and not the runners. Um, the questions from the audience here live? I read a book one time, uh, The Monarchs Coming in Across Lake Ontario. It's quite a journey. So probably when they get to Western New York, they're hungry. I would agree, John. Let me just repeat what uh, John said. He said he read a book once about the monarchs coming across Lake Ontario. And he correctly pointed out that by the time they get to our shores, they're probably pretty hungry. So that's another pitch for please plant the nectar rich plants for them because in the fall, they do need to bulk up as much as possible. And with the declining numbers, it's more important that those that are here are well fed so they can continue that journey to Mexico. Um, because in Mexico, we have lost habitat as well. And that area 
in the mountains above Mexico City where they concentrate in the winter has shrunk and there have been uh, provisions put in place by the Mexican government to stop logging and uh, that hasn't been universally successful. So the area that they have to migrate to is shrinking. Um, Jan and I listened to a program last week and they said that in order to just meet sustainability, uh, the minimum number of acreage is seven acres. The equivalent, the Mexican equivalent, because they don't measure in acres, is seven, which when you stop and think about it, seven acres to support all of the monarchs uh, that are in the Eastern population, which is everything East of the Rocky Mountains is not very much. So that really, again, highlights the call to action that we need to restore their habitat, starting in Ontario, and as John was talking about, moving all the way through and along the entire 3000 mile route, because as they leave Ontario, come across Lake Ontario, they're very hungry, they eat here, but then they've got most of their journey ahead of them. So all the way down, there's a need for gardeners to be making and for local municipalities and government organizations to make sure that there are nectar rich plants available that will sustain them all the way to Mexico City. Great point. Uh, any other questions for Pam? This is a really interesting topic for us. I'm glad we were able to cover it today. And it's probably a lot of information, but um, we will put the recording up on YouTube and anyone who registered through Zoom, you will get a link once we have it up and I will have the references and where you can buy plants as a PDF that I'll send out with an email. I know Sharon had emailed us before the program. Um, hopefully, Sharon, you did get some ideas of plants you can add after the Joe Pieweed bloom. Uh, asters and goldenrod are always um, good options if you can find ones that fit your garden. And I am going to email you um, about the wild carrots that showed up in your yard because I'm curious about that. Uh, does anyone else have a question? If you're on Zoom, you can unmute. Dad, do you know the name of that book? Do you know the name of the book? I just read them. I don't. Know. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to try to find that book. And if we do, we can provide the name of the book as well. It sounds fascinating. Okay. We can do that. Well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank Pam for all of her hard work and interesting program today. So I hope everyone enjoyed it. And if you do have questions, feel free to email me or the Master Gardeners. Uh, one last thing, I just wanna make a point. Pam divided her flowers up between perennials and annuals. So cosmos to zinnias were annuals and the ones before that were perennial. Just wanted to point that out in case anyone had questions about that. Well, thanks everyone. I hope we'll see you in October, either online or in person, and we'll get the link out to you as soon as we have it up on our YouTube page next week. Have a great day.